Hi, I'm Roger Mishrod. At Franklin Templeton Investments, we believe that citizens need to be informed about the resources that can help make higher education more affordable. That's why we're proud to support programming produced by the Caucus Educational Corporation and their partners in public television. Funding for this edition of One on One with Steve Adubato has been provided by Investors Bank, New Jersey Natural Gas, proud to support education in our communities, Celgene Corporation, committed to improving the lives of patients worldwide, the law firm of Gibbons PC, New Jersey Sharing Network, dedicated to saving lives through organ and tissue donation, Josh S. Weston, and by Choose New Jersey. Our mission is attracting companies to the Garden State. This is One on One. When you first heard that they were doing Charlie Rose and Gail King, didn't you go, what? People like laughing at others, so I don't mind if the other is me. See, you go right into the character. That's what it is. <laughs> I'm bringing families together a half an hour each week. I mean, I'm doing something special. And so I do feel successful. Welcome to One on One. I'm Steve Adubato. It's our pleasure to welcome for the first time Dr. Kevin Yao, who is a neurosurgical oncologist, Englewood Hospital and Medical Center. Good to see you, doctor. Thanks for having me. Uh, explain what neurosurgical oncology is. Uh, it's someone like myself who specializes in the surgical treatment of brain and spine cancers and tumors. Okay. Now, is there something unique or what is it that is unique about those particular kinds of tumors? Uh, well, they're tumors that involve the brain and spine, and so typically um, I treat patients who either have cancers or tumors that start in the brain or spine, or even more commonly I see and treat patients who have cancers that start somewhere else in the body, and then secondarily these tumors and cancers can make their way to the brain and spine, and then we try to help patients who have symptoms from those. You know, I've got to, I've got to imagine um, that treatment that the way you treat these particular cancers has evolved dramatically over the years as the technology and research has expanded and grown. It has, it right? has, yes. One of the areas, and I've seen um, a lot of literature on this, and I see some promotional pieces talking about true beam radio therapy. Mm -hmm. Yes. I see these huge machines in these ads. I say, okay, true beam radio therapy, it's groundbreaking. I'm thinking, okay, what is it? What difference does it make to the patient, and why do we need to know about this? Yeah. Well, I mean, just to give you an example for what I do, um, traditionally, say, you know, half a century ago, the only way to really deal with a, a cancer that made its way to the brain, say someone had cancer in the lung that secondarily spread to the brain, the only way to do treatment for that kind of tumor was either uh, what's called whole brain radiation, meaning you basically blanket the whole brain. The whole brain. The entire brain, not even just the area that had tumor, but the entire brain with a dose of radiation, hoping that that kind of general treatment would tr control the tumor. Hoping. Hoping, right. Or, or a second option would be to do open brain surgery. So you can understand how... Open brain surgery. Yes, just, yes. Just, for those of us who just hear that expression, but have absolutely no idea what the implications of that really could be, describe open brain surgery, then put in perspective this true beam situation. Yes, yes, well, you know, the, the technique of open brain surgery, um, or specifically the way we describe it is a craniotomy, meaning actually opening up the skull and then delving into the brain to take out a tumor in the brain. That technique has really evolved a lot uh, over the past, you know, half century to century. But clearly, it's still invasive treatment where a patient has to be admitted. They have to be able to tolerate usually general anesthesia, all the stresses to the heart and lungs of having this major surgery done, as well as, you know, obviously to to take out a tumor that's in the brain, particularly if it's deep in the brain, that Isn't requires there other tissue involved. Exactly. That so that there is some manipulation of normal brain tissue to get at the tumor to take it out. How has it changed with the true beam? So, or the true beam right, so with, so with true beam technology, which is a form of radio surgery, we can actually treat these brain tumors uh, without open surgery, without an inpatient hospital stay, and without any manipulation really of the normal brain. How? Um, essentially what radio surgery is, is focused beams of high dose radiation, all focused on the three-dimensional nature of the tumor, meaning 
all these little beams of radiation essentially cone in on the tumor such that the tumor itself receives a really, really high dose of radiation that essentially kills it. But where all those, all those, all those separate beams sort of go through, all the normal brain tissue essentially receive minimal to no radiation. And the patient after this procedure, describe the recovery for this patient doctor post true beam versus the other kinds of procedures you were talking about. Yes, so you know, following a, an open brain surgery, um, even in the the most smooth. Give best case scenario. Yeah, best case scenario, a patient has the surgery done. Um, within a couple days, they're up and around moving, and so that by say like three days after the surgery, they're finally going home. But they're going home still with a pretty significant recovery period ahead of them, where they go home and still need to deal with managing the wound and really kind of regaining their strength, which all in all takes at least. I'd say the next two to four weeks after, after open brain surgery. It's very different than radiosurgery. With radiosurgery, this is an outpatient ambulatory procedure, meaning yeah, we do all the planning ahead outpatient? of time. Outpatient? Yes, ambulatory. So, which that means is we do all the planning beforehand um, so that we know exactly how we're going to do the treatment. They come in on the day of the treatment. We make sure they're um, situated just right on the radiation device. We actually do imaging at the time of the treatment so that we essentially can see the tumor with the radiation device and then target the tumor. And essentially the treatments are you know, anywhere from a few minutes to maybe half an hour. And then they essentially have, you know, the, the treatment itself on that day really has no effects at all and they go home. No effects? Yeah. yeah. So they go home and what? And then they basically resume their normal life. Um, and Side then, effects? You know, what side effects there are, are side effects of the tumor essentially reacting to the radiation. So occasionally the tumor might swell a little bit and that sort of thing, but generally patients do very, very well from this with no effects at all. Doctor, what are the implications long term of what we're talking about? Well, I mean, we're talking about a totally you know, revolutionary type of radi uh, cancer treatment that essentially is non-invasive, hmm. but highly effective. For you, but I'm curious about this. I asked you before we sat down to officially start the interview. When did you know that this was the field you wanted to go into? Um, I think the first time I interacted with a cancer patient is the first time I really kind of decided this is what I wanted to do. Because the relationship you form uh, as a doctor with a cancer patient is very different. I mean, it's a long-term relationship where you really are, you know, helping the patient with the most basic needs. Um, and you essentially see the patient all the way through. Is it personal for you? It is, it is. It's personal for you. It is. I mean, uh, you know, it, it, you can't help but make it personal when you deal with cancer patients and, and try to help them. It really is. You don't buy the argument. It's interesting without getting an overly philosophical discussion. That's what Patch Adams, the real Patch Adams, because mm -hmm. there wasn't just a movie. It's a real person, right? <laughs> yes, yes. And, and he said that to practice humanism in medicine, as our mutual, our good friend, Dr. Arnold Gold, talked about, mm -hmm. right, mm -hmm. who started the movement uh, yes. called humanism in med medicine. He said, you cannot take the empathy and compassion out of great clinical care. You believe right. that? I, I definitely do. Um, I mean, there's nothing more rewarding than having just a routine checkup with one of my cancer patients that I've treated and just see that basically they're, they have a totally clean bill of health, you know, and, and they're so happy and they just resume their normal lives and they have their families there and, you know, there's nothing, there's nothing more rewarding than that. Dr. Kevin Young, we are very proud and glad that you do what you do. And more importantly, your patients and their families are happy as well. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me. We appreciate it. Thank you. Stay with us one-on-one -on -one with fascinating people. We'll be right back right after this. Thank you. To see more one-on-one -on -one programs, visit us online at oneonone.org. If you would like to express an opinion, email us at info at caucusnj.org. Find us on Facebook at facebook.com slash PhD and follow us on Twitter at Steve Adubato. Hi, I'm Steve Adubato. Stay with us in this next segment as my colleague Joanna Gagas visits the Horizon Connect Retail Center, an innovative effort that is simplifying the complicated world of health insurance for its customers. Do you have questions about your health insurance coverage, about your benefits? Would you know where to go to get those questions answered? And is there a person you could speak to? If you've ever asked yourself any of these questions, you're probably like most of us, who sometimes find our health insurance confusing. 
Welcome back to Life and Living, I'm Joanna Gagas. In this next segment, I'm taking you inside the Horizon Connect Retail Center in Moorestown, where questions like these are answered by people face to face every day. I'm here with Patty Slocum, who is the Horizon Connect Retail Center Manager. It's a beautiful space here. What, how would you describe the daily activity here? The daily activity at the center is really a very big mix of different customers coming in. We usually see about 25 customers a day. Um, they are customers coming in f that are interested in education on purchasing a product or they may already have Horizon Blue Cross Blue Shield coverage and they may have a question about their insurance. What are some of the most commonly asked questions that you're feeling from the customers? So questions about their current benefits is one of the biggest inquiries. Uh, if they a customer is not certain if a particular service is covered um, and how much coverage they would be entitled to, they're going to come to us. We'll sit down with them and we have face-to-face -face meetings with them and any kind of complex inquiries, we will see them through to completion for them. And we make certain that they have a complete understanding before they leave. What would you say are some of the greatest challenges of communicating with your members? Sure, well, um, complexity is number one. Health insurance as a product is not simple. Um, folks don't always understand the terms that we throw around in our industry, copay, coinsurance, deductible. So one of the things we're able to do really well here uh, is take the time to make sure that we educate folks on what they're about to purchase or if they've already purchased, what it means, and again, how to get more value out of their healthcare dollar. The other complexity that we see in the market which is not just a horizon phenomenon, um, are the constant changing regulations. So the Affordable Care Act is a massive law that has impacted essentially every stakeholder in the healthcare continuum from physicians to hospitals to brokers to health plans to consumers. And we see ourselves uh, as having a, a pretty unique responsibility to help demystify things a little bit John, what first brought you to the Horizon Connect Retail Center? Joanna, for the last two years, I've had like a knot in my stomach. Uh, I hate to start out that way, but I needed to get information on getting more affordable health insurance for myself. I've had my own health insurance. I've been paying for it because I'm self-employed for the past 20 years, so I've been paying for it. It's gotten very expensive. It was more than mortgage on my house. And what it was doing is like, I sit there and write my check and say, writing my health insurance check is making me sick. It was like putting a knot in my gut and uh, I just needed some help somewhere. I tried going online by myself. You tried going to healthcare.gov? Healthcare.gov. What happened there? Um, I got so far, I got like maybe one or two pages done and pushed the submit button and it stopped. And so I, the website stopped working? Yeah, it stopped working. So uh, I think I tried it one more time and I got a little bit further, not much information. It was a lot of like your name, this, that. Um, Did you find it confusing? I found it confusing that I couldn't, I couldn't uh, get anywhere with it. And I found it confusing because I, I do better if I talk one-on-one -on -one with uh, a person. Tell me about John Weiss. Oh, John Weiss, oh, he was awesome. John was um, one of those people that came in here very um, pessimistic about the whole insurance. He was frustrated. His business was slowing down. Income was slowing down. So he came in, he was frustrated. Um, I literally took him through 101 insurance. And when he left here, it, it was such a rewarding feeling for me. What did he leave here with? He left here with a lot of knowledge. One, he left here with the fact that he was able to purchase a plan that was affordable. With that, he was able to get um, assistance through the Affordable Care Act, health care reform, um, learn about how his plan work. Um, also, he found that he was able to keep his current doctors because they were in Horizon Network. Did you understand what subsidies were available to you under the Affordable Care Act? How did Sada explain that to you? Sada showed me what the policies were actually based on and the cost for them. And then she explained the subsidies, you know, based on your income. When someone sits down and explains it to you and shows you that you don't have to be poor, poor to be entitled to a little bit of help from the government. 
I thought to myself, I need help. That's okay. I told her what was important to me and what wasn't. And there were different policies. And she put me right where I needed to be. And we talked about it. And she explained it to me. And uh, she explained it so well that I had very few questions. And when she answered my questions, I understood them. I didn't have to ask another one. So it was, it was good experience. Why is that face-to-face -face component so important in the communication with the members? It's a very complex arena, health insurance. Um, our team members really offer that personal touch. They never rush a customer out of the center. The world of insurance is so complex and it is so difficult as a consumer to understand what some of the jargon means, to understand what's available to you. How do you, in your communication with the members, make sure that you present the information in a way that's digestible? First and foremost, we never use acronyms. We always will really spell everything out to a customer. Um, we explain what everything means. Um, we also use what we call kitchen English to convey our message. We don't get caught up in technical terms. I noticed that there are tables set up. They look very comfortable maybe even like something you would have in your home. It, was that part of the design? Yes, definitely. Explain that. So we wanted you to feel comfortable when you come in the center and around a kitchen table at somebody's home perhaps, you feel comfortable and you're, you're able to engage in a nice comfortable conversation and, and you feel warm and friendly environment and that's what we work to create here. How do you feel that this center, this, this retail center, has changed your members' perception of their insurance? Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, it, we think it has. Right? And you think about traditional retail setting, the thing that gives you comfort when you buy something or have an interaction with someone is you can come back to that person if there are follow-up questions, if you're not satisfied, if you need a better explanation. And that's what the folks tell us. And they love the fact that they know that Justin or Sada or Alethea, our agents, um, are going to be there. They know their schedules, they know when they're working, and they know when they can come back and, and talk to them again. Good job, guys. We have people from northern New Jersey, further southern New Jersey, that come here. They take that, they make that sacrifice, they take that drive hours, two hours, just to be to, to have that face-to-face -face interaction with us here. How important was the face-to-face -face for you in terms of getting all of your questions answered? It was the most important. It was the most important. It's, it's all about finding the information, having someone who sits down with the knowledge to explain it to you. I was misunderstood because a lot of people, when they start talking about the Affordable Care Act or the Obama plan, they called it, not being knowledgeable about it, you know, first thing it does is it, it like puts doubt in my mind. But somebody told me what it was really about. And you know what? I got it. I got it right away. There's nothing like person to person. To see more one on one programs, visit us online at oneonone.org. If you would like to express an opinion, email us at info at caucusnj.org. Find us on Facebook at facebook.com slash PhD and follow us on Twitter at Steve Adubato. There he is, Dr. Matthew Jones, chairperson, Department of Communication at uh, County College of Morris. Good to see you, Matt. Good to see you too, Steve. Uh, Matt, you and I are aficionados, students of the world of communication and why mm -hmm. it's so complicated and fascinating. Uh, talk to us about a shift that was made organizationally at County College of Morris as it has to do with communication and what its implications, more importantly, are for the students. Sure. Um, we started this past uh, August, so we're a year into this project, um, of having created a Department of Communications at the County College of Morris. Uh, we came out of the English and Philosophy Department. Uh, our communication and our journalism major came out of the English and Philosophy Department. And we also brought along with us broadcasting from the Information Technology Department. Uh, I think uh, our faculty work very well together. Uh, Michelle Art Altieri, uh, David Pallant, uh, Ray Kalis, myself, and our new administrative assistant, uh, Lindsey King. Um, so what we felt actually was that broadcasting, communication, and journalism uh, really belong under one umbrella. Do we? Uh, Do we? I mean, it, it's interesting. Our, our, our world mm -hmm. of broadcasting and communications, I mean, 
you know that we've talked about this. I mean, I teach in the field, mm -hmm. and, and I'll talk to students and ask, you know, why do you want to go into broadcasting? I want to be on TV. Right. Really? Is that what you want to do? Mm -hmm. Well, you better rethink it because communication, broadcasting, and media is a lot more than TV, right? Sure, of course. What is it? Um, well, one of our new uh, faculty members, uh, John Soltis, um, who teaches journalism, uh, he brings with him the idea of uh, backpack journalism or mobile journalism. And this is where uh, the student not only has to be proficient in writing, but also has to be proficient in uh, video editing, also has to be proficient in audio recording, also has to be uh, proficient in photo aesthetics and things like that. And so I think that's um, journalism having gone through a period of transition. That's where we stand right now in terms of creating a context where students can acquire multiple proficiencies and bring them to bear on any given task. And it changes the uh, yeah. curriculum. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that versatility in the communication curriculum, in the journalism curriculum, in the broadcasting curriculum uh, is essential. And that, that versatility, in my experience, uh, what I've learned over the past year, is that it comes from interdisciplinarity. So you have to be able to be interdisciplinary. You have to talk to your colleagues who are um, in the liberal arts, for example, in the humanities, uh, in, uh, in art, uh, and and, um, you know, recently, this past uh, year, I worked uh, with one of our faculty members at CCM, Jefferson uh, Cartano, uh, from the engineering department, and Maureen Sutton from the business department. Um, and it was, it was my role to help in their interdisciplinary collaboration between engineering and business. So you had one team that was dedicated to creating a project or solving a problem, and another team that was dedicated to marketing it. And it was my job. Um, and several of my colleagues who teach in speech, our job to come in and to uh, talk about how to present uh, to the marketing students and the engineering students Because as well. they don't have that skill set. Right, because they're not used to, you know, if you have a great idea, uh, very often, especially in the competitive engineering uh, marketplace that, that we're in today, you, you could have a great idea, but if you can't communicate it effectively, sometimes it's hard to uh, present it to non-experts. But that is not just true. Obviously, we know that's not just true in engineering. It's, in, sure. it's true in, in the legal field. It's true in the accounting field. It's true in the banking field. It's true in the medical field. That's mm -hmm. why there are so many in the healthcare field who try to talk about what's going on yep. in healthcare, and they're talking about it in code with jargon and acronyms and no one understands. And you're like, well, wait a minute. Right. You have to communicate not for yourself, but communicate for the others who are not understanding. And they're like, what? I don't understand. And I'm will say, exactly, that's the problem. And so even though there's all this new technology, and even though information is instantaneously accessible to us, it has virtually nothing to do. In fact, in fact I know there's a question here, I promise. It may, in fact, make it harder for many of us to be more effective communicators because we're convinced if there's so much information out there, everybody must know. Of course. Not true. Of course. Um, yes, I, th I think that you're absolutely right on that point, that very often media can serve as much as a, a barrier to communication as it can a facilitator of communication. I'll tell a, sto a story real quick. I was on um, a New, Jer New Jersey transit bus once, and uh, there was uh, the conductor uh, was using the PA system, which very loud and scratchy. The very, very clear sound, no? Yeah. <laughs> to, uh, <laughs> to get people to stand back from the door. And... Um, uh, they wouldn't do it, and so rather than simply, it was only a few feet away, rather than simply walking over, and I, I understand the apprehension, and, and I probably in some ways would have had the same uh, tendency, <laughs> um, but it was a way of using communication or using technology as a barrier rather than uh, as a facilitator of communication. Let's just talk through communication, because if we speak through communication, I will have been able to say that I use the technology to communicate with you, but the reality is this. I'm not real confident that the message I tried to send you was the message you received. Mm -hmm. But I could say I used it. Sure. But it would have made a lot more sense to simply be 10 feet away from you and grab a, hey, listen, the sure. platform's over here. Yeah. Technology isn't always a right. better way to communicate. To right. communicate. Sure. I mean, I think one of the things that, um, you know, you as a communication scholar yourself, we, we, you know, are probably familiar with the work of Marshall McLuhan. Yep. One of his most famous aphorisms. Is the medium the message? The medium is, is the, the medium message. Sure. the message? Sure. I mean, that's one of the points I think that's, uh, that's really pertinent to what, to what we're talking about here, which is any time you introduce a new medium of communication, you're introducing a whole different set of complications, Excuse a whole me, different isn't that set why, of Sorry for interrupting. Isn't that why you have a course that teaches students, I'm not sure what it's called, 
uh, aesthetics, I think. Media uh, aesthetics, Media aesthetics. Yes. You mm -hmm. teach students how to watch TV and help them understand how they could be manipulated. Sure, I taught that for one semester. Our faculty member, Ray Kalis, uh, teaches that. Um, and it absolutely is, is the case is that, that you know, what he's focusing on are the, are the factors or vectors that uh, rally the audience's attention um, and, and, and gain or detach for example, them from their engagement. Uh, for example, why, um, in terms of composition, would you place an object or an actor or a person in one part of the screen rather than another? Uh, what role does camera movement play? What role does depth of field play in, um, uh, you know, in, in crafting the message? Or, li or like the Kardashians, that's real, right? So, <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry I had to sorry. do that. I'm sorry. You love what you do. I do. Because? Um, because it allows me to connect with people. And I think that uh, for myself, that's not uh, something that comes easy to me. And I think... Um, Seems uh, like it here. Well, that's, that's, that's my practice persona. But I think at the same time, um, you know, I, I, it's become real. You know, there's, there's this old adage that uh, be careful what you practice uh, because eventually you become, you become that thing. And, and I think that, um, you know, it's, it's through understanding uh, communication processes analytically and inter interpersonal and mediated processes analytically that I have come to feel more comfortable doing this. And that's what I want to share with students. Um, the idea that theory, theory can inform practice. And the more we understand the processes of communication analytically, media analytically, the better we become as communicators and we, the better we can tell our stories. And being able to tell stories is critical. One on One with Steve Adubato has been a production of the Caucus Educational Corporation, celebrating over 25 years of broadcast excellence. Funding for this edition of One on One with Steve Adubato has been provided by Investors Bank, New Jersey Natural Gas, Celgene Corporation, the law firm of Gibbons PC, New Jersey Sharing Network, Josh S. Weston, and by Choose New Jersey. Promotional support provided by The Star Ledger, powering NJ.com, and by Commerce Magazine. Transportation provided by Airbrook Limousine, serving the metropolitan New York, New Jersey area. Hi, I'm Peter Rooney. In 2006, I lost my father to renal disease. He was on the waiting list for a new kidney, but did not receive one in time. Unfortunately, so many like my father have lost their lives while waiting for a life-saving organ. At New Jersey Sharing Network, we're committed to saving and enhancing people's lives through organ and tissue donation and by informing people about this important decision because you can make a difference and save a life.